Hello Tower Gaming players, this is Evan Jarvis, also known as Gripst, and welcome to part 5 of my multi-table tournament guide. In this section, I'm going to introduce to you your arsenal of weapons as a tournament player. Depending on your stack size, i.e. the amount of big blinds you have, there are certain things that you can and cannot do. This section will cover the moves that you will need to implement as your stack starts to get desperate and your options become limited. Part 6 will cover the moves that are available when you are dealing with a bigger stack and have more freedom. By sticking to the outline I provide you, you will be making correct plays rather than quote-unquote giving it away, as most players do. The guidelines provided will help you both tread water when you are sitting on the bottom of the totem pole, keeping you alive in the tournament, as well as choosing the best spots to gamble with the hopes of accumulating a big stack. Before I get into the actual moves, I want to outline your goals with the various plays and the reasons that should be used. Let's begin with fold equity, which is the chances of making your opponent fold their hand, allowing you to pick up the pot. To maintain a certain level of skill in tournaments, you have to have enough chips to make your opponents fold. If you allow yourself to get too short stacked, your opponents will be priced in to call your all-in bets with any two cards, and this is when the tournament becomes a luck fest. As an aspiring tournament player, your job is to make sure you always have some level of fold equity so that you can make it through the tournament without having to go to showdown. Being able to pick up chips without going to showdown reduces your variance because if you can make your opponent fold, you're guaranteed to win the pot. There's no 50-50 or 80-20 situation where there is a possibility of getting unlucky if you are successful in making your opponent fold. So to reiterate that, if you are able to make your opponent fold, you are guaranteed to win the pot. The more that you're able to increase your stack, the more of a risk you should be willing to take in terms of your actual holding. When you are looking at only a small increase to your stack of say 2 to 4 percent you want to be confident in the strength of your hand since your reward is very low while your risk is very high. As the reward becomes greater meaning a larger percentage increase to your stack the cards become less important and you should be willing to put your money in the middle with less than stellar holdings so long as you have fold equity. Anytime you can increase your stack 10 percent without showdown it's a very good result Anytime you increase your stack 20% showdown, it is a great result. And if you can increase your stack by 50% without showdown, it is an excellent result. So, you should keep your eyes peeled for opportunities to score these major chip-ups without showdown. Pot equity is what percentage of the pot you expect to win based on your cards versus your opponent's cards. You should be familiar with a coin flip, meaning that you have 50% pot equity. If you have a flush draw against top pair, you have about 30% pot equity with two cards to come, and so on and so forth. When you are priced in, meaning the amount that you have to risk versus how much you will win equals your equity in the pot, then you have to make the call. For example, if you have a flush draw, and your opponent bets all in for a thousand into a pot of one thousand on the flop, you are looking at a cost of one thousand to win two thousand. So, since you have about your thirty percent, more than your thirty-five percent, you should make the call. Another example would be if someone moves all in for three big blinds and you're in the big blind with any two cards. Well, now there's already four and a half big blinds in the middle because of the small blind being half, your big blind being one, and his push being three, <coughs> and it costs you two big blinds to call. This means that you are getting better than two to one on your call because you are risking two chips to win four and a half, rounded down about two to one, a little better. So since your odds with any two cards against any non-paired hand are more than 30%, you should make the call and gamble. As long as you aren't against aces or uh, a big pair that leaves you with two undercards, you are getting the right price to call and gamble. Sometimes, however, you want to avoid gambling if calling and losing means that you will lose a lot of flexibility in your chip stack. 
If you have a lot of moves in your arsenal because you have a stack of over 40 big blinds, you don't really want to be gambling for 20 or 30 of those big blinds, even if the math is slightly in your favor. With a bigger stack, you have fold equity. And with a much wider selection of moves, and therefore you should avoid gambling in spots where your arsenal of weapons will shrink up if you don't hit the cards that you need. As you get shorter and shorter, your choice of weapons will drastically decrease. Don't take this as you need to use a certain weapon before you lose that option because of your stack size. If a good spot to try a play presents itself, you should definitely take it. But if nothing ever comes up, it's okay to blind off and just try to use what weapons are available. Don't create a spot. Don't try to make up a move out of nowhere in a spot that isn't there. Wait for the right spot. And when it comes, be ready to pull the trigger on it. So, let's begin with the shortest of stacks and how to guide it. The jam is uh, where you jam all your chips in the middle, maximizing your fold equity and giving yourself the best chance at winning the blinds and antis. Here we have the little video of a fold to the button who shoves the stack in, which would be between 5 and 20 big blinds, and picks up the small blind and the big blind for a successful jam. When you find yourself with under 12 big blinds, you really only have one move all in. If you raise and get re-raised, you'll be priced into call anyway, so when you bet, you might as well bet the full amount to maximize your fold equity. What you're really looking for when you're on the short stack is to find a good spot to jam all in to pick up some blinds and antis before the blinds hit you and you become even more short stacked. You want the odds of your opponents folding to be as high as possible, so you want to look for weak players, and the greater the percentage increase to your stack will be if your move is successful, the less important your actual holding is, your cards. With five to six big blinds, you are looking for a pot where no one else has opened and you will be the first person in the pot. If you let the blinds go through you again with five to six bigs, you will have no fold equity. So you have to pick a spot before the blinds hit you to move all in. Since your time is short, you pretty much have to pick the first hand that looks good and move the stack in. This includes any pair, any suited connector, any Broadway hand. Your hope is that everyone will fold, and you can pick up two big blinds. And if you get called, just hope to get lucky and suck out. With 8 to 12 big blinds, you should have a bit more time before you become super desperate with no fold equity. So your pushing range should be a bit more selective. A general guideline for shoving with this stack size is, in early position, the first three seats, you can shove ace-9 suited or better, ace-jack off suit or better, king-queen, pocket sevens or better, jack-10 suited and better. Once you get into middle position, you can now shove with any suited ace, ace-9 off suit or better, jack-queen off suit or better, any pair, and any suited connector, 8-9 suited or better. Finally, once you get into late position, meaning the cut off the button, sometimes the hijack, you can shove in any ace, any connector, 8-9 off suit or better, any pair, and any suited connector, 6-7 suited or better. So, I mean, like any two Broadway fits in there too. You can shove a pretty wide range because with fewer players left to act, given that you're in late position, you have a better chance of being successful with the play. Now once you get to 12 to 20 big blinds, you should be really selective about when you move all in. The reason I say 20 big blinds is a good time to implement the jam is because from some positions, you don't want to get, you don't want to raise and get flat called and miss the flop, having put in a good chunk of your stack. The hands that you can shove with the higher end of big blinds for our 5 to 20 big blind range include from early position pretty tight ace queen ace king pocket tens and better 
in middle position, ace jack and better, pocket sevens and better. And finally, in late position, you can shove ace ten or better, king queen, and any pair. With this stack size of 20 big blinds, the higher end, we no longer want to shove the suited connectors to gamble because we're risking a lot of chips when we jam, and the jam isn't the only move in our arsenal anymore. We have some other tricks we can throw in the mix now. We want to have a hand that dominates a lot of our opponent's hands when we get called when we jam this large amount of big blinds. We aren't looking to gamble to get lucky to get our stack back. We're looking to get a huge stack if we get called and we want to be a favorite doing that because with 20 big blinds you're by no means desperate anymore. You've got a lot of play. So also remember that once you're at this upper end of the big blinds you can pass up on spots to jam all in if you think there are better ways to chip up at your table. What I've outlined is a general guideline for what hands you should be jamming with on a normal table. You can jam a wider range of hands if you have weak players behind you who are very unlikely to call. The less likely you are to get called, the less important your hand is because if no one's going to call you, you don't have to show the cards and you just pick up the pot. For example, if you had five big blinds in the small blind against a total knit in the big blind, you might as well shove any two cards. You're increasing your stack by 40% if he folds. A, he's only calling you about 10% of the time, so you're winning 9 out of 10. And even when he does call, odds are you still have 30 or 40% chance of sucking out, and you can get a nice stack from that. So some spots, any two cards will do the trick. Obviously, with fewer players left to act, you are less likely to be called, which is why our range for jamming gets wider as we get later in position. We have also less chance of getting snapped off by a big hand, less chance of getting coolered. And against tougher players, we often want to be jamming large amounts of big blinds with hands that are tricky to play post-flop. If you put all the money in pre-flop, your play is basically unexploitable and your opponents can outplay you. Now let's look at the rejam, which is similar to the jam in that we are jamming all our chips in the middle, but with this play we are jamming over an opener. So we see in the clip the loose player in the cutoff opens to steal the blinds and we in the small blind say, no sir, this pot belongs to us. Ship it in and pick up the pot. For you to have fold equity and your opponent not to be priced in, you must have more big blinds than you did with the shoving stack. So the proper stack size for the rejam is 12 to 24 big blinds. When you have this stack size, you are still very limited in your play. You can make jams with the appropriate amount of big blinds that we just discussed, and you can also rejam in good spots. However, you should not be opening light to steal the blinds. As I said before, we are looking for major chip-ups in tournaments without showdown. If you open and then fold to a re-raise, you are doing the exact opposite, a major chip down without showdown. Since a raise on this stack size means 10 to 20 percent of your stack, you should never open a hand with it unless you're planning to call all in if you get re-raised. <coughs> when you are re-jamming with 12 to 24 big blinds, your fold equity is extremely high so your cards aren't as important as they were with the open jam. However, as you start rejamming in the upper range of 20 to 24 big blinds, you want to have something decent because, again, your risk is higher, but the reward remains the same. When you have 12 big blinds, a successful rejam increases your stack about 40%. Whereas when you have 20 big blinds, a successful rejam will increase your stack about 20%. The ideal spots to rejam are ones where there is one opener, and there is a very good chance that he is trying to steal the blinds and therefore opening without a real hand, thereby giving you a large amount of fold equity. The other ideal spot to rejam 
is against a player who isn't necessarily opening super loose, but one who will only call your rejam with the very best hands in his opening range because he's very concerned about having the best hand when he calls. He doesn't like to gamble. These types of players will be folding way too often, meaning the math is way in your favor to go for this play. When you are rejamming, the type of hand you must have is dependent on how likely you are to get called. If you think there is a 90% chance that your opponent is going to fold, you can rejam with any two cards. On the other extreme, against opponents who are going to call you fairly often, rejamming with pairs, big broadways, suited connectors, and big aces is fine since you will have a lot of equity when you do get called. Your hand will run very well in a hot and cold situation. Remember, your primary goal is to get your opponent to fold and let you chip up uncontested, but if they do call, your backup goal is to have the best chance at sucking out for a double up. Because when you double up with a rejam stack, you will find yourself sitting with a lot of chips. So keep your eyes open for who is opening a lot of pots, who is folding to re-raises, and who is calling all-ins with a wide range of hands. This will give you a good idea of what type of hands you should be rejamming with against which opponents. Next, we have the stop and go, which is a mix between the jam and the rejam. Let's just let the video play. We are hero in the big blind and we get raised. First, we stop instead of jamming the whole stack in, and then on the flop, we go. The difference between this and a rejam is that we're basically saving our bullet for after the flop. But I'll go into that a little more. Um, the stop and go is the play you want to execute when, again, you think someone is opening too many hands, but they will be priced in if you move your stack in pre-flop because you're so short stacked, and thus they will be correct to call you with any two cards, and most loose players are smart enough to do that and take their pot odds. So to execute a stop and go, you want to be in the big blind and flat call a loose player's open. Once the flop comes down, you move your stack in regardless of what comes. The idea with this play is that it increases your fold equity because if it's a very scary flop for your opponent or they missed completely, they just might fold their hand. Whereas pre-flop, they were definitely going to call you with any two cards because they were priced in. This is a little trick that allows you to increase your fold equity. It's a very risky play. But the key is, once you have decided to do a stop and go, you can't bail out when the flop comes. If you need to, just cover the flop with your hand before you go all in, because flatting a raise with this stack size and not making a play afterwards is total disaster for your chances of winning the tournament. Like the rejam, you will be looking for loose openers and players who aren't very familiar with the play. The loose players will often be looking at nothing when you jam the flop on them, no pair, no draw, and have to fold. And the tight players will often get scared and give you credit for a big hand because you're making such a big bet. The stop and go is a powerful play, but can only be done with this very specific stack size of 8 to 12 big blinds. Any less, you have no fold equity on the flop, and any more, you're risking too much, and you might as well just reshuffle pre-flop. Uh, so make sure that your flop shove is between one, one half and 1.5 times the size of the pot. Like I said, if it's any less, you won't have much fold equity, rendering the play pretty useless. For both these moves, I mentioned the rejam and the stop and go. You should be executing them at a strong table. This is because at tough tables, you don't have time to wait for hands. You're going to get blinded away and ran over. And there aren't many good spots for chipping up. So when you're faced with a tough table draw and a good opportunity comes up, be sure to take it as it might be the only opportunity you're going to get. All right. The coin flip. Something everyone's familiar with. Uh, you know, we got a jam. 
and Hero sitting in the big blind with some sort of hand, I guess. I don't know what he has, but we'll find out. And Ace King against pocket twos for whatever size pot could be for 10 bigs, could be for 80 bigs. But Hero successfully spikes an ace and accumulates a whole bunch of chips. The coin flip is something that all poker players and poker fans are familiar with. Big Slick gets it all in against a pair, and it's the classic race situation, and it's up to the cards who the victor will be. With the short stacked nature of tournaments, a lot of gambling must take place. And to be a successful tournament player, you have to know when it's right to gamble, and when you're better up, better off passing up on a spot. The first consideration when deciding if you want to flip or not is whether it's a plus EV situation. If you are likely to either be ahead or flipping, then you should be more inclined to gamble. If, however, you are either totally crushed and flipping is the best case scenario, then you should be less inclined to get your chips in. Pretty obvious. Uh, with Ace-King, you can't really go wrong getting the money in because you're almost never dominated. It's the situations where you have a medium pocket pair where it comes down to your opponent. Is he the type to move all in with any pair, or is he the type who's only going with ace, king, and jacks are better? Asking yourself that little question will help you a ton in your decision to fold or call and gamble. If you have a lot of chips, you should be more inclined to take coin flips with people. 60-40s, even 70-30s at times when pot odds are good. You know, if you can afford it, there's usually nothing wrong with gambling. You're going to have to win coin flips to win a tournament anyway, um, but the key is to flip for smaller portions of your chips rather than all of it. If you flip for a quarter of your stack and lose, then another quarter and win, you'd be even. Uh, but if you flip for your whole stack and lose, there's no second chance. You're out of the tournament. So generally speaking, if a gamble is for less than a third of your chips and you think you're in decent shape against your opponent, you should be very happy to take the gamble. In decent shape includes 50-50, by the way. Once you're looking at half your chips in the middle, you should be very careful about getting your money in the middle on a coin flip because it's really going to affect your stack size flexibility and your arsenal of weapons as you should be already learning from this slide, seeing that the more chips we have, the more moves we can make. Taking flips also means calling someone's late position shoves with modest holdings like ace-9 or king-queen, where you're expecting to be in a 60-40 situation against your opponent's total range for shoving all the various hands that he could have. All the considerations below um, pertain to both situations where you think you are in a 50-50 or where you could be slightly ahead or slightly behind. Um, the last consideration when deciding whether or not to take a coin flip is what the possible outcomes could be. First question, what sort of stack size will you have if you fold and don't take the flip? How many weapons will you have in your arsenal? Second question, what sort of stack size will you have if you gamble and win the coin flip, or 60-40? Third question, what sort of stack size will you have if you take the gamble and lose? If you already have a comfortable chip stack, but losing the coin flip would put you in jam or rejam mode, you shouldn't be eager to take the flip. If, however, you have 30 big blinds and the flip could get you to 40 big blinds and a full arsenal of weapons, whereas losing would put you in a rejam mode, which isn't too far from 30 big blinds, the potential gain has a lot more value than the potential loss. The more weapons you have in your arsenal, the more the tournament becomes about skill and the less the luck factor is. So if you can run your lock and take a flip that will put you in a powerful position but not take you out of the tournament if you lose so you'll still have that second chance it's usually worth it to take the gamble you always want to become a big stack if you can as it's a lot easier than grinding the short stack and flipping is a great if not the best way to do this uh, let's look at an, an example if you're already in good shape 
but taking a flip could make you the dominant tournament chip leader with under 40 players left, then it's worth gambling, regardless of what the situation is. Because having an overwhelming chip lead allows you to abuse people so much that it's almost always worth taking a gamble to get the super stack. Because when everyone else is trying to move out the pay structure, you're going to be the one picking up all the blinds and all the antes and putting all the pressure on, guaranteeing yourself a top three finish and putting yourself in a great position to get first. With some experience playing tournaments, you'll know what stack sizes give you a lot of power and what shorter stack sizes you are still comfortable playing. There is the whole rule book, but it's really a personal thing. How many chips is a minimum that you'd like to have? These considerations will let you decide personally what are good spots to take coin flips and what are good ones to pass up on. Finally, we have the cooler, which is also a well-known situation. A cooler is basically a setup hand where the money is going in the middle, no matter what the two players in the hand do. Examples are big pair against big pair, set over set, combo draw against over pair. You get the idea. Uh, the main thing with the cooler is to just hope that you're on the right side of it because there's no getting away from it. It is what it is, and if you're behind, you just hope that you get there. So in our example, aces against kings, heroes on the right side, and scoops a nice pot. In a lot of cooler situations, you are at the mercy of the deck, and all you can do, as I said, is pray the cooler is in your favor. However, with good observation, there are some times when a cooler can be avoided. For example, if someone opens and a super tight player re-raises him in early position and you have pocket jacks or pocket queens, there is no need to get your money in. In this case, you are either facing aces, kings, and in some percentage of the time, ace-king. So you are either flipping or you're completely dead. Um, so it's okay to fold a big hand there. Against a loose player's 3-bet, however, you could be getting involved against a smaller pair than yours. So that's a case where you are often a header flipping and you would never in a million years think about folding queens or jacks. You want to get involved when the cooler is more likely to be in your favor, but you can only make a good guess if you have been paying attention and have good reads on your opponents, so make sure you're watching the table. If the cooler is post-flop and you flopped a monster, you have to know how to extract the maximum value. If you flopped a set on a draw heavy board and your opponent most likely has an overpair, you need to play your hand fast before a scare card comes, because if a scare card comes, it might let your opponent off the hook and you won't get the maximum value. If the board is dry, you can consider slow playing but you also have to be aware that over cards can come which will scare him off as well. The general rule is if you flop big and your opponent for the most part only has big hands, raise the flop and try to get it in since it looks a lot weaker than calling the flop and raising the turn and it also doesn't allow for scare cards to come off. In the case of a very aggressive opponent who might, might have a big hand but also has a lot of bluffs, it's okay to slow play. Uh, some tournament players are super aggressive and never stop betting. And against these guys, don't worry about the board getting scary because he's going to represent those scary cards. Just call down and allow him to bluff off his stack. If at any point you raise against a super aggressive opponent, they will know that you have a hand and they will fold a lot. If, however, you stick with calling them down, they will assume you are weak and try to muscle you off your hand, which of course you don't have any intention of folding. So this, this covers your arsenal of weapons for guiding a short stack and trying to get to a big stack. If you use these moves properly and have a little luck on your side, you will find yourself with a big stack and a legitimate chance at winning the tournament. These moves are also very good for preserving your tournament life and allowing you to work your way to the late stages of the tournament despite being on a short stack the entire time. 
it's not unheard of for someone to be in like fifth last place as soon as the money bubble bursts and stay there until the final table and catch a huge heater and win the tournament. It happens. So when you find yourself short, don't give up and just throw your chips in the middle. Follow the guidelines, look for spots that work for your chip stack, and you'll be surprised at how long you can survive. Now, let's just hope you can get that double up, and in the next lesson I will teach you how to work that big stack. This has been Evan Jarvis for Tower Gaming. See you at the top.